Thank you, Lindsay. Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see so many friends and customers. 14 minutes. Uh, I can do it. Please note our safe harbor statement. Okay, so many of you know BioLife and the company and our products. For those of you who don't, uh, here's a brief overview. Our mission is to become the leading provider of biopreservation tools for cells, tissues, and solid organs. We're based near Seattle in Bothell, Washington. And we have a wonderful campus there with 22,000 square feet under lease. The company was founded in 1998. It traded as a penny stock on the OTC from 2002 until March of last year. In the first quarter of last year, we completed a reverse stock split, a $15 million equity raise, converted all the debt to equity, and uplisted uh, to the NASDAQ capital market. Today, we have 42 uh, team members. We're growing at 30% per year. We have no debt. We expect to break even next year. The corporate culture and company has received numerous accolades. Uh, most recently, Seattle Business Magazine named BioLife one of the 100 best companies to work for in Washington State. A shot of the production facility where our facilities are on the first floor and the corollary admin building where we have our non-manufacturing quality administrative offices. You notice a lot of uh, sunshine and leaves there, a rare sunny day in Seattle. Yeah. So the mission of the company, why are we here? This is all about preserving biologic material. We know that we can remove biologic material from the body, be it solid organs, tissue biopsies, tumors, blood and bone marrow, and really do some remarkable things to uh, improve lives and save lives. In addition to uh, supporting drug discovery, a number of regenerative medicine cell therapies using our products, uh, be it for autologous or allogeneic therapies, and a number of biobanking and personalized medicine applications. So what do we do? Well, we subject these cells and tissues once removed to hypothermia. Why? So we can reduce the need for oxygen and nutrients. This does work. This allows us to move these very precious materials across time and space. But it literally is a race against time. Once removed from the body, viability decreases. Uh, the number of cells that can survive, not only the cold, but also the thaw. And really, the question is if we're using uh, the optimized tools and processes to make sure that the most cells can actually return to function uh, once inserted or infused into the body. So we use hypothermia here to mitigate hypothermic uh, uh, stress and cellular injury. At BioLife, we have a couple of opportunities to help customers such as yourself do this, both in the form of optimized low temperature preservation media products and also improved cold chain management solutions, which I'll talk about in just a moment. The obvious goal is to maximize the effectiveness of biologic-based medicine. Okay, so a review for uh, some of you and others. First time look at the, the preservation media products. First is CryoStore. This is a DMSO-based freeze media, serum-free, protein-free, animal origin-free, made only with USP or multicompendial uh, ingredients and supported by a US FDA master file. Pretty remarkable across the broad array of cell and tissue types, uh, CryoStore has shown the ability to improve post-preservation viability and functional recovery. Uh, and specifically formulated to mitigate these molecular cell stress pathways that are encouraged or enabled through the use of uh, hypothermic storage or freezing. Next up is hypothermosol. This is a 2 to 8C cell and tissue shipping and storage media. Again, serum and protein free AOF. Again, highest quality available ingredients and supported by a master file. Uh, and this uh, hypothermosol has, again, across a broad array of cell and tissue types, uh, enabled multiple days of ex vivo storage for transport of both starting material and manufactured cell products. The products, as you can see, are packaged to integrate in customer workflow. So bottles, bags, vials, weldable, sterile dockable tubing, so on and so forth. Next up is Bloodstore. This is a family of generic freeze media solutions. We started with Bloodstore 555 for freezing cord blood stem cells. And most recently launched the Blood Store 27 NACL. This is for freezing of therapeutic platelets. The materials uh, in product contact are all uh, DMSO compatible. So the bag, inner layer itself, tubing ports, and connectors. Also early this year, in response to the worldwide shortage of infusible dextran solutions, we launched our own dextran cell thaw medium products. Again, 10% dextran 40, either in sodium chloride or in dextrose. You know these are used to transition frozen cells to room temperature for clinical administration. And the products have been shipped now to 40 new customers since the March 2015 launch. Something we're very proud of here is the adoption of cryostore and hypothermosol in cell therapy regenerative medicine clinical trials. To date, the count is now over 200. You can see how they break out by clinical indication. 
very happy to tell you that the majority of T cell companies, private and public, are using our products. This is a different view of that data that shows across the phase of development, left to right, and in clinical indication top down, where our customer clinical trials are engaged in it. And, you know, this is really encouraging. We have, you know, more than uh, 20 so in uh, phase three now 80 plus in phase two. They're not all going to make it, we understand that, but this represents significant product adoption and a really great growth opportunity for BioLife. We think we can, uh, we can monetize the annual revenue potential from any one of those at between a half a million and two million dollars per year should the product get approved and the customer commence large scale commercial manufacturing. A little bit of eye candy here in terms of preservation efficacy. Every customer that adopts our media products go through a number of comparative evaluations against a whatever they were using. This happens to be some MSCs that were isolated from bone marrow. They were stored in the cold in the left in the saline-based solution in the right in our hypothermosol. After five days, returned to culture conditions. And then a day later, after recovery, assayed to see what's going on. So whether or not you understand what these fluorescent micrographs represent or not, you can clearly see the, the cells in hypothermosol look really great. Confluent monolayer, you can clearly see the cytoskeleton, mitochondria, and the, the nucleus. So why have we seen this a really great uptick in product adoption? It's all about yield. So commercial companies understand that uh, yield can make a, or break commercial success. We help our customers uh, improve yield with starting source material. What does that mean? If you can achieve uh, or manufacture more doses from the same given amount of source material, cost can be reduced. On the final downstream side, if you can achieve the same therapeutic effect with fewer cells, the variable cost per dose can be reduced. Many customers use our products in both the front end and the back end. Extending shelf life through the use of hypothermosol as a 2 to 8C storage media. This is a wonderful CapEx lever here. Uh, with limited shelf life or stability, what must our customers do? Raise a bunch of money. Why? To put a manufacturing plant on every continent. We know one example here in our space that that's exactly what they had to do. Using an optimized storage media that affects a number of days of ex vivo storage, customers can now serve the world through one clinical distribution point. Now I'd like to shift gears here with just seven minutes left here and talk about a new cold chain management initiative that we launched. This is Biologistics, Intelligent, Informed, Precise Biologic Materials Management. We understand that we have uh, two opportunities again to help customers and we, we view this really as the bedside to bench to bedside continuum, starting at the left with the patient with the removal of some source material. This has to get to a factory. So we can offer an improved temperature control container and also optimize preservation media. Once the cells are manufactured on the return leg or the reverse leg back to the patient, same thing. Helping customers to optimize tools and processes in the form of preservation media and also uh, better containers to do a better job to regulate temperature. Some uh, current biologistics realities. Uh, all vaccines and 70% of biologics are temperature sensitive. Particularly in our space in Regen Med, they're all temperature sensitive. There's limited temp stability using traditional containers and there are cell viability issues and temperature excursions that do occur. And probably most frightening is there's very limited use of real-time temperature monitoring reporting for every shipment. I'll talk about that in a minute. What are the risks? Two main, two main pillars of risk here. One is clinical and that would be the risk of administering a, a thermally sensitive dose that was exposed to a temperature excursion or a packout error or it's exceeded its stability period. And the economic uh, risk as well, the cost of having to scrap a dose uh, for any of those reasons. And you think about small scale clinical trials, uh, this is really important. Common practice today, we would recommend that you don't do these things. Most thermal validation profiles don't include a payload, they're very generic and not re representative real world conditions with temperature sensitive payloads. The use of drop in the box data loggers that don't have a wired thermocouple don't really measure the payload temperature, they measure the container temperature. The R values that you might see from various shipping container companies in their marketing brochures don't mean anything. You have to do a validation with your system. And common practice rely on a validate and assume approach as opposed to real time dynamic monitoring for every shipment. Here are some current solutions that are available, foam coolers on the left and some very complicated, expensive VIP or vacuum insulated panel containers on the right. Uh, each have their own uh, limitations uh, in situations regarding uh, pack out simplicity or lack of. This is our Evo Smart Shipper. This is a super insulating container. You can see it has three pieces, a bottom cold pack, the payload carrier in the middle and a top cold pack, that's it. Simple packout procedure. It's a smart box. There's a cell modem embedded in the base that's monitoring the payload temperature, ambient temperature, a number of other parameters, and transmitting that data as well as location to the cloud. Durable and designed for reuse. I'll talk about that in a minute. And covered by some really cool claims in a patent application uh, that we filed. 
This is the Evo Smart Shipper family. It runs in three modes, two to eight C, CRT, so 20 to 25 more or less, and then a cryo with a dry ice, okay? Some really cool novelty on the payload carrier itself, again, covered by some uh, patents uh, that we, uh, we filed. There's a PCM in the base, and so we can protect the payloads uh, from cold packs that aren't allowed to sweat or warm up. Typically, the cold packs are frozen. If you forget to let them sweat and you put them right in the container, you're going to freeze the payload. So the use of this PCM material provides some thermal insulation and protect that. What else might happen? Well, you might imagine the situation where someone packs out in the morning and then for some reason the delivery doesn't puck up till later in the afternoon. Someone well-meaning or well-intentioned might put the entire shipping box back in the refrigerator. Without this protection, the frozen cold packs will kill the cells because they'll be frozen. One of many high-value uh, features we've integrated into the system to reduce pack out errors. A little bit of validation data, I'll go this, through this really quick. So we subjected here, you can see three different EVOs, concurrent testing against the ISTA 70 warm and cold profiles. And we we're looking to see how much thermal autonomy can we, can we achieve here. Both with a, a payload of 250 mils of water and then the same test with no payload, just air. And here you can see with a payload here, we've got 84 hours with 2 to 8C. And the three EVO temp graphs are close enough together, it's, it's pretty hard to tell them apart, okay? Next is the no load, same sort of thing. We lost a little bit here because air is clearly hard to, uh, harder to insulate and to uh, protect thermally as opposed to something that's more dense. But we still have more than three days of uh, temperature, temperature autonomy here. Same thing on the cold side here. So you can see this if you know the ISTA profile here, that initial uh, warmer excursion is not on there, but we added that anyway just to see how well the EVO does. And here we've got more than four days. So really, really great performance. Same thing with and without a payload. This is the app, we call it Biologistics, it's cloud hosted. Through one interface, again, no leaving to go to a shipper website, customers can now pack out, select and pay for the outbound and return shipments, tracking during transit, configure actionable alerts for themselves and the downstream recipients. We have return and reverse logistics built in so it's easy to get the Evo back. 21 CFR compliant, audit function and an API for LIMS and other customers and partners who might be interested in some data integration. A quick look at uh, the dashboard. So you log in, you can see some active or historical shipments. You can see some pending shipments, some recently delivered uh, shipments with how much stability was left. Once the shipment is picked up, customers can monitor in near real time, depending on if it's in an airplane or not, the payload temp and also the ambient temp, pressure, tilt, humidity, shock, vibration. You might say, well, who cares? We'd say, well, we don't know if that's important or not. Over time, through aggregating the data, we can correlate to viability and functional performance. So we'll be helping customers collect that. The actionable alerts, you might think about setting up alerts for downstream recipients such as uh, an oncologist. Maybe the phys physician wants to know when the cells arrive. Why would they want to know that? Well, we can tell them in a text alert when the package arrived, when it was opened, and how much stability period is left. If there's 18 minutes left and they see that, they're going to be very involved and interested in making sure the warehouse and the pharmacy does what they need to make sure those cells get to the patient and can be infused in time. Really, really great value add in terms of uh, all the stakeholders in the clinical care chain. If you drill into a shipment, you can see where it is. You can look at parameters and, again, configure the alerts. Our growth uh, is clearly based on uh, you know, this plan that we're going to have a nice army of these shippers around the world uh, being used uh, transporting thousands of, of shipments as we deploy these. So the growth catalyst for BioLife and how we're going to create and capture value, it's really all about uh, capitalizing on our regenerative medicine customer base as some of them make it over the goal line here. And we think that will occur in the next uh, oh, three to four quarters. This SaaS business model, so biologistics is a SaaS model. You subscribe to it. This is the Internet of Things or IoT if you follow that. And then uh, helping customers to uh, reduce uh, clinical trial risk uh, and, you know, fighting off the increased regulatory scrutiny and mitigating the cost of clinical trials. Next year, we'll break even 25 to 35% growth. Uh, and again, looking for some customers to uh, get their BLAs approved and commence distribution third or fourth quarter of next year. Thank you very much. I did it. Appreciate it.